Hello, everybody. Hopefully it's live. I Sometimes I genuinely don't know with this thing. Sometimes it goes live a little bit later before I say or after I say hello. And I'm just like, I'm so sorry, guys. I promise I say hello in every single one of my live streams. But welcome. This is um, another one of our random live streams because I just want to hop on here and talk to you guys and things. And sometimes there's weird hours throughout the day that I am able to do that other days that I'm not able to do that. So this just, you know, it just helps me stay um, up to date with you guys and you guys stay up to date with me. So like I said, it's a, a Q and A and everything, but I'm also going to touch on a topic that I've noticed uh, an uptick in recently, especially ever since I started watching the quiet on set, uh, documentary, so to speak. I think they lost, uh, they left a lot out of that documentary, but uh, in general, there are some things that like, I would love to go over a little bit and stuff and talk to you guys about. I also have some Q and A stuff to talk about with you guys. Um, so overall, just a lot. Oh, Ireland. Welcome, Samuel. Hello. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm horrible at names, but hey, Nick. Hey, G Carlo. I'm going to call you Carlo because I cannot pronounce names for the life of me. Um, welcome, everybody. So for those noticing my hat, yes, we have official haters will be prayed for baseball caps in. You can get them on my website here. Um, they are a $30 donation with shipping included in that price. That's how all of all of my stuff on my donation center works. So basically you donate a certain amount and then you get a free item in return. Um, and of course, like I said, shipping's included and stay tuned for those limited edition May crowning veils coming out on May 4th. You guys saw that in my last live stream. So those are absolutely gorgeous. I don't know if I have a photo of them here. Um, I feel like I did, but I am not 100% sure if uh, I was able to get photos on here for that, but um, you're just going to have to take my word for it. They are really pretty and I absolutely, I just, I love them. So with all of that being said, um, today we're going to kind of do a little q and I put one up yesterday for Instagram and I was like, oh, I can answer this on Instagram or I could go across all my platforms and, and kind of answer this. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of what we're doing. Um, yes, Meg, I can, I can totally do an updated, uh, daily prayer routine and everything like that. Once I'm married, 100%, I still plan on doing all of those things. So, um, 100%. I, I would love to do that. But first, we're going to start off with a few Q&As off of Instagram. Of course, if you guys have questions as well, I will do my best to get to all of them. But of course, I can't. I'm one person. If there were five of me, we'd all be talking at the same time. It'd be chaotic. So with all that being said, um, we are going to, uh, I guess, kind of just get started. Okay. So the first question comes from Jenny, and she says, as a Catholic wife, hoping my Protestant husband converts, what is the best way to help him? So when it comes to these situations, it's really difficult. I don't know how you guys got into that situation. If you were Protestant and then converted during marriage or uh, what that whole situation was, but we can't really force anyone to convert. We can't make somebody have the conversion of heart that we want them to have, especially if they're not feeling it. I dated a Protestant on and off for a long time. Um, and the entire time I did feel like when we were broken off, it was a situation ship more than anything else. When we weren't dating on and off, whatever you want to call it, um, his, when we weren't dating, his prayer life would be really, really good. And he would be, you know, uh, listening to K-Love, which I'm not a huge fan of K-Love personally. I just think all the songs sound the same. I prefer some good Gregorian, ch Gregorian chant. Um, but then when we would start dating again and I'd be like, oh, it looks like your prayer life's really well. Like you're doing a lot of stuff that I would actually want a future husband to do. Um, as soon as we start dating again, it's like all that stuff fell off. So um, for me, I couldn't force him to have a conversion that of heart that he wasn't ready to have. Um, and I realized that and that's why it ended up you know, I permanently broke it off was because I realized, you know, if he can't give me what I need, then there's no point in pursuing this. But this is different, right? You're married. There's a lot more history here, you know, so but the the, the same thing still stands. You can't force somebody to convert. 
So I would say continue planting the seeds. Ask him to go to adoration with you. Ask him to go to mass with you. Um, but if he says no, don't get super upset about it. Don't try to be naggy about it. Just kind of put it on the table because men hate nagging. We all know this. They also hate being pressured into doing something they're not ready to do. Uh, so I would say start off small. Start saying grace at the dinner table. Have conversations about it. Be open to those conversations with him if he has questions. Now, if he's just not interested at all, just set the example. Plant the seeds. Start talking about your faith. Put it in his line of vision, line of you know sight. So put up a at-home prayer altar put a kneeler in the living room, hang some rosaries around, listen to relevant radio when you're in the car together or while you're just doing housework. All of these things can help convert someone without them even knowing. But the biggest thing is going to be prayer and suffering, like just offering up your sufferings, your penances and your prayers for him. That is going to be what changes everything. Um, because really it's through God, you know, we, we aren't, we're, we're not the ones that are creating these conversions because in reality, it's all God. He uses us as tools for those conversions, but we are not the, the ones who at the end of the day actually have somebody convert. That is all God. And so we just need to be a tool in God's hands and follow him. But hopefully those tips help. Uh, let me know how it goes because I know that that can be a really stressful time, especially when there's that type of religious division in the family. I don't know if you have kids, but kids catch on to that kind of thing. So I, I totally, totally get that. Um, okay, so let's see here. <laughs> Josie asks, how do I wear skirts while working with three to five year olds? I, um, I'm not sure what kind of job, if it's a teaching job, if it's something else, I love skirts. I think they're great, but you also have to be practical about them. Um, maxi skirts are super long, so it might not be the best idea because you could trip on them. The kids could sit on them or step on them too. I suggest like ankle length skirts or maybe like calf length skirts if you want to keep, um, you know, that. If you have uh, leggings, then you could put, uh, you could probably wear knee length skirts, whatever. Um, but, you know, kids are kids. So they're probably going to want to go under your skirt and stuff because I, I, as a babysitter, I'd completely understand that. Um, but I would say pick a length of skirt that works for what you're doing. Um, I, I found that that works the best. I've also worn a lot of dresses. I, um, the girls I babysit, they, uh, the youngest um, used to love it when I would wear dresses because I would pick her up and I'd spin her around. And then as I was spinning, my dress would come out and it would spin around with her. And she just thought it was the coolest thing ever. So easy way to entertain kids. Who knew? Um, but uh, yeah, I would just say pick a material also that's not going to be too hot um, that stretchy, weird, synthetic material often is too hot. I would opt for something more like cotton, um, something more like linen. Um, those are probably my go-tos. And then at the end of the day, you know, if it's just not working, don't be afraid to wear pants. You know, I, I think sometimes we make things too difficult on ourselves. And if that's something that's been put on your heart, definitely pursue that. But if it's more like something you want to follow just because it's a trend, um, I would, I would definitely say, um, I would definitely say to, I don't know, just, um, I don't know, just don't make it too difficult on yourself. You know what I mean? Like make sure that you're giving yourself grace and that this is something God's put on your heart. Um, or it's just, you know, something you're passionate about, but not because you feel pressured to do it by other Catholics online or something like that. Cause I've noticed that quite a lot as well. Um, so yeah, I would suggest that. And then, um, do, 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 do. I'll keep this person anonymous, but they ask how to get over breakups quickly. I mean, you can't really put a timeline on emotions. You can't just be like, okay, Monday I went through a breakup. So by Friday, I'm going to be completely fine. It's not really how it works. 
Things that do make it easier, though, is when you're going through that situation to block the person, don't have any kind of communication with them. This can be difficult if you guys are in the same friend group, though. I've noticed that quite a lot. Um, but I, I've definitely seen some people have a harder time getting over a relationship when they have the same friend group. So keep that in mind. Um, but unfollow them off social media. Don't do the whole, oh, we can still be friends thing. Never works out. Don't fall for that. It's BS. Don't, don't do that. Um, and honestly, I think what's most important is feeling your emotions, like not just getting over it, but feeling your emotions to a proper extent, like don't let them control revenge or wanting to go out and hurt that other person or, you know, to a point where it's a affecting your way of living and, and stuff. But if you want to eat a tub of ice cream and watch the notebook, okay, like that's fine. Have some Kleenexes on hand. After about a week though, you should be able to not need that, right? Like we might still feel some pain and stuff, but you should be able to kind of uh, not have to break down. Things, should, things that remind you of them shouldn't make you really, really upset um those types of things also take it to prayer i mean prayer is super super important i would go to adoration multiple times a week if you can if you have an uh, um a oh my gosh uh an adoration chapel we have a 24-hour adoration chapel which is really great i also have a lot of local churches that offer adoration at different times of the a week so i would go to adoration as often as you can um you know i think those things help but there's no formula that's like, oh, you'll get over this person in like a month. Um, there, are, there are things you have to do. You have to distract yourself. You have to work out, um, take care of yourself, take care of your relationship with God, hang out with friends, prioritize hobbies. Uh, there's a lot of things. Distractions are really good to help you just get back on your feet. But um, I think at the end of the day, I think you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get a ladder and get over it. I mean, you know, we definitely need to acknowledge our feelings, not push those down, but don't let your feelings, you know, control you. And I think emotional chastity is really important in these situations because a lot of times you might want to reach out to that person when you listen to that song on the radio or, you know, uh, you pass a, a restaurant that you guys used to go to or something. Having the emotional chastity not to reach out to that person or to not want to hurt that person or date one of their best friends, as Taylor Swift says, um, you know, having that amount of emotional chastity that really helps you grow and mature for another relationship. That'll be better. Um, and it'll make you, you know, it'll teach you how to avoid the relationships you don't want. So I think, you know, all of those things combined could really help, but yeah, there's just, there's no real way of just being like, oh yeah, I'm going to be over this person in a month. Also, can I just say, I am drinking hot coffee. Here's the proof. Who am I? Who am I? Because I don't know. I'm drinking hot coffee. It's also like loaded with a bunch of stuff because I don't like hot coffee. <laughs> it tastes gross. But at this point, it's basically lukewarm coffee. So... Mm. Mm. Okay. I'll probably end up um, putting a lot of these, um, uh, what's it called? Um, oh my gosh. Q and A's. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'll probably end up putting these Q and A's on uh, the Instagram because I have so many here, but I definitely wanted to touch on a couple of those just because I think they kind of, uh, affect everybody in a way. We've all gone through something like that. Um, but 100% cheers coffee gang. We love, we love the coffee gang, Stevie 100%. Um, but yeah, so I, I agree. Um, it's awesome. Oh my gosh. Wow. Juan, thank you so much. Wow. I really, really appreciate it. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Keeping you in my prayers, definitely. Um, keep up the great work, you know. Takes a lot. But I'm glad you're a traditional Catholic, you know, getting in the getting in the um, trenches, so to speak, especially with all the stuff that's going on today. So we need more good Catholics. 100%. 
Um, do you have friends and family getting married within weeks that you are? I have four close friends getting married within one to three weeks between me. I'm over, I'm feeling overwhelmed. How do you balance that? Yes. So let me just pull up my little calendar here. So I'm getting married. Then our other friend is getting married. And then my other friend is getting married. And then my other friend is getting married. And then my sister's getting married. And then my best friend's getting married. And then my other friend's getting married. And this is all week by week, might I add. And then it chills out for about three months. And then I have another wedding, another wedding, and another wedding. So yes, um, I have a lot coming up. How do I balance it? Honestly, you have to not be afraid to say no. Because all those weddings that I listed, I have them on my calendar. I'm not going to all of them. Obviously, I'm going to my sister's wedding. I'm going to my best friend's wedding. And I'm going to my other friend's wedding. But at the end of the day, I need to also take care of myself. I can send them a beautiful card and uh, support and buy them something off their registry. I'll try to make it to some of the events that they have, like a bridal shower, something like that. But I might even just go to the ceremony and not the reception. I've done that before too. Uh, so really just being honest with yourself and what you can handle. Don't feel like you have to, um, I think that's the hard part about us, like people pleasers <laughs> is that, uh, you know, it's, it's really hard for us to say no because we want to see these friends. We want to support them, et cetera. And you can 100% do that. But if they're in different parts of the state and you have different things going on, you know, when, when Max and I were doing all of our wedding planning, sending out invites, doing all of those things for us, whoever could make it and whoever was going to be there is who needed to be there. We weren't going to be upset if like one of our best friends couldn't make it or something like that. Not because we don't want them there, not because we don't love them, but because we understand people have their own lives and their worlds don't revolve around us, you know? And yes, 100%, we would love to see them be at the wedding, but we're also not like, okay, you're not at our wedding. Like, I can't believe like we were ever friends. Like, no, like that's not how it works. Things come up, I understand. And so just being honest with yourself and being like, I'm just genuinely not up for this. I can't make it. Um, it's different if you accepted to be in the bridal party already and you've made some commitments. It, you can still back out because honestly, I think it's better for you to be upfront and honest and be like, hey, I know I said I could do this and at the time I could, but seeing how things are going now, unfortunately I can't and you deserve somebody who's able to uh, support you and be there for you during this time and I just simply can't do that. Now, a good friend will be like, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for being honest with me. We'd love to still have you, but you know, that's great. Thank you so much for just telling me. Because otherwise what you get to the wedding day, you start doing all this stuff and you're not present. You're tired. You can't even make it. Some things you might not even be able to go to, right? So um, I think honesty is really important with ourselves and our friends. And uh, it's a lot. You know, it is a lot. So if you have to travel a whole lot, just be like, I love you guys. Like, I definitely want to be there, but maybe we can do something just us all together when when um, things calm down a little bit. You know, there's a lot of ways to get around it. If they're not, if they're in different states, that's the hard part, right? Because that's a lot of traveling. Um, and it's not your fault. It's not their fault or anything, but it's difficult because you don't want to pick like who you go to and who you don't like picking favorites or whatever. But at the end of the day, you can't burn yourself out for other people either. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard though. 100%. I, I feel your pain. Everybody's every, almost every single one of my friends is getting married this year, including like my sister. So, um, yeah, let me just, do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. sorry, wedding stuff, it's kind of like time consuming. Okay, so anyways, that's, that's the answer. 
How does one start wearing a chapel veil when not many others are wearing one? I'd like to start wearing one, but I don't know the full purpose of wearing one. I have a lot of veiling videos. Um, you know, we veil what's holy. Uh, we in women, you know, we can create life inside of us. And that's another reason why we veil because you veil, uh, you know, just precious things. And so, okay. Um, also just, you know, uh, imitating our lady. That's huge too, right? We want to imitate our lady. So those are reasons to veil. Obviously it's a relationship between you and Christ. God puts it on your heart. You want to veil because you feel like it'll bring you closer to him. It's humility, um, helps you grow in the virtue of trust and humility and uh, meekness. So those are all reasons to start veiling. But I, um, I would say that if you want to start veiling, nobody's really doing it yet in your area and you're maybe uncomfortable veiling a little bit because nobody else has been doing it or is doing it. I would say to get a veil that matches your hair color. This is very common. A lot of people tend to do this. Tons are on Etsy. I have um, a very simple black veil. At the time it matched my hair color because I dyed my hair black and well, obviously my hair is more like a brown. I don't know the type of brown, but it's brown. Um, and so I would say do that. Read up on some veiling. I think, um, I forget the website. Hang on. I'm just going to type it up real quick because I think, here we go. Yes. Oh, wait, no. Well, um, yeah. But that's not the website I was thinking of. Correct, but not, here we go. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna put this in the chat for you guys because I'm not gonna read the whole article, obviously, because that's a lot, but it gives you a lot of good information on veiling, where it comes from, why we do it. It's just a little more in depth because I think it's important um, that we know why we do something, right? I think that's one of the reasons I fell away from the church. I had a lot of questions, didn't know why we did certain things. And at the end of the day, you know, I ended up finding out those things for myself. So um, all good, all good. But uh, Kate here, thank you so much for the donation. Really appreciate that. Um, close to converting to Catholicism. I'm bored with it all, to be honest. My only hang up, I'm just gonna put this up here. Only hang up uh is what happens if there's a period of total corruption do catholics have to support that even if they disagree because of the submission to rome so there's something called blind obedience right so if the pope told you to trample a crucifix would you do that probably not so when it comes to corruption in the church we go all the way back to the beginning we go back to jesus and judas like judas was one of the 12 right and even he was corrupt he corrupted the the um himself a lot, but he was the corrupt one in the group. And that was the closest of Jesus's apostles. Like there were a bunch of disciples, but he, these were his closest 12 and he was betrayed by one of them. So God is kind of setting us up to understand that there will always be wolves in sheep's clothing. And the Catholic church isn't exempt from that. Now, when it comes to uh, a total period of corruption, we need to remember that the gates of hell will never prevail um, against the Catholic Church. That's something that God stated, the gates of hell. Now, things could get really bad. We know that. We see that today a lot. But I think the best thing we can do is to find a solid church, a solid priest, and, you know, stay close to the sacraments. And people are always kind of um, annoyed at me when I say this, so to speak, but turn the news off for goodness sakes. Just turn it off. Stop reading the articles. Stop reading the Twitter posts. Stop reading the assumptions. I mean, a hundred, 150 years ago, most, or not even that, probably more than that. People knew obviously who the Pope was and what his name was, but a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago, nobody even knew the Pope's name. They didn't know what he did, but nowadays People know when the guy sneezes, as Father Ripperger likes to say. So everything's under a microscope now. News articles corrupt things. Things are constantly being twisted because the world hates Catholics. And a lot of Catholics even today will create controversy. 
and they will create division just for clicks and views and money and likes. And it's really disheartening to see. So um, I would say just turn it off, please turn it off. Love your neighbor. Find a solid church. I haven't read Catholic news in a long time. The only things that get sent to me are if it's like breaking news, as in, um, and it's from trusted Catholic sources. So 100% Clay, you have to ignore it because if you don't ignore it, it's going to impact your peace and your peace is really important because God is not a God of fear. He is not a God of anxiety. He's not a God of depression. Those things do not come from God. They come from man and sin and the devil, right? God allows some of these things for our sanctification, of course, but a lot of us tend to feed into it and we can't break out of the cycle and it causes a lot of emotional stress. It causes us to give our faith up, which is the one thing that we need to cling to during these times. And I think too many people know what's going on and it's not good for their mental health because they go down the rabbit holes. They know too much. They, um, it starts assumptions. They're like, oh, well, what about this that happened back then? And, you know, at the end of the day, why does it matter? Not saying like we shouldn't care. Pray for our bishops, pray for the Pope, pray for all of our leaders. But prayer and fasting is going to do way more than dragging them through the mud or reposting a, you know, controversial clip. Now I'm guilty of this. I do repost controversial clips just to bring people to realize we need to pray for our leaders and for, for these people that are creating these abuses. However, it's not the basis of my ministry. My ministry is not to tell you about everything horrible going on in the church. It's to tell you about the mercy and love of God. It's about my story. It's about other people's story. It's about how to grow in faith. It's about how to keep your faith life strong, even in the midst of, you know, uh, struggles and just what's going on today. Um, so when I post something like that, it's to bring attention to this person for prayers, not necessarily to drag the people through the mud or to, um, create controversy. But I know so many people who do that. They go online and as soon as something comes out of the, the Vatican, it's instant, just like Pope Francis did blah, or Cardinals did this, you know? Um, so I definitely think that it's an issue um, and it's an issue that we need to address because it's getting to the point where all this fear mongering, all of this paranoia, it's not from God, right? We know the fruits of something, sorry, we know something by its fruits. And if the fruit is rotten, you know, it's causing division, it's causing anger, it's causing, you know, these outbursts, then clearly it is not good right? It's not from God. But you also see a lot of amazing things on social media. And there's some good stuff that does come out. But we need to keep in mind that at the end of the day, the world is going to hate us. And we just need to stay close to Christ, his church, the sacraments. Um, so I would suggest that. I would just suggest definitely converting, um, continuing your, your walk in this way. But just remember that sometimes it's better to turn the news off and just remember and have trust in Christ uh, than it is to just go down these rabbit holes and think about like, well, what if? Because at the end of the day, you know, the world is our ship, not our home, as St. Tre uh, Therese of Lisieux used to say. So you know, I think we need to keep that in mind. Did this not send? Oh, no, it did. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, there's, there's that. Um, da -da 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 -da. but let's see. Sorry. I just had a whole bunch. Um, there we go. All right, we're going to now talk about, um, and I don't mind answering some more questions, of course, too, but I also wanted to kind of talk about um, this thing that I've been noticing a lot. Like I mentioned in the beginning of this video about how, you know, I watched the newest, the, the newest um, Quiet on Set and everything. The documentary itself didn't hit me as like, wow, this was really good. 
because I genuinely feel like most of us already knew about all of this outside of the Drake Bell thing. Um, we already we already kind of knew about you know the Dan Schneider stuff and the the whatever his name Peck guy and all these pedophiles and things, and we already kind of knew about that, so it wasn't like oh surprise, you know. Um, so I, I just think that uh, you know at the end of the day you know, I, I wasn't surprised by anything on there. Oh my gosh, Cade, thank you so, so much. I, I truly do appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, and God bless you on your journey. I think it's beautiful that you want to come into the faith. Thank you. Um, so I, so yeah, I was watching the show and as I was watching it, uh, some more things kind of came to mind to me when I was watching that. First of all, we have justice in Walmart's. You guys are were girls, Claire's, Justice. These were stores that, as a preteen, we flocked to. It was so cool. You got like the earrings that were like plastic with those spikes on them, and you got your ears pierced at Claire's, and you went to Justice for your outfits and tank tops and crop tops and whatever else you were wearing. And it was all targeted for preteens and kids because it was still modest, you know, but. And it had like these giant logos on it and everything. Um, and so I just really realized that, you know, I was like, well, what's happening? What's happened to these stores? I went to a mall recently, no preteens in sight. Um, it was a weekend. And instead, as I was walking past one store that I used to go to when I was probably like 17 or 18, American Eagle, I saw all the preteens in there. I was like, what? you guys are not old enough to be wearing these outfits yet, you know, the really skimpy crop tops. And obviously nobody should be wearing those to begin with, but you know what I mean, especially for like 10, 10, 11, 12 year olds, like what is going on? So I was like, whatever. Okay. Well, maybe, you know, it's just a style thing. Who knows? Maybe their mom took them, whatever. I walk a little further to Sephora and Ulta, and even though I don't really go there all that often, I notice just this flock of 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds and 12-year-olds buying all of these, you know, makeup products, but also these face serums and stuff, and we all know about the whole 10-year-old Sephora thing. It's all over the internet. I'm a little late to the game there because I've, I've known about it forever, but I haven't really talked about it. And, like, these kids are damaging their kids' skin with harsh chemicals that really should not be using, you know, anyone should be using really, but especially not a child. The only thing you should be using on your face is beef tallow. And that's, I make my own beef tallow and I wear it and it's great. Yes, secular parent, parenting at its finest. But the other thing that I noticed is there's a lack of kids shows. So when I was watching the Quiet on Set, you know, series and everything, I was watching that and I was just like, yeah, you know, I I remember all these shows, iCarly, Drake and Josh. Um, you know, there were so many, Rugrats even. And I was never really introduced to those until I was probably about 14 or 15. We didn't have cable. We didn't have Disney or Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network or any of that probably till I was a teenager. So I wasn't introduced to any of that until later. But when I was a kid, we watched Discovery Kids. We watched The Saddle Club, Bindi, The Jungle Girl, Zumafoob, uh, Zumafoob. Oh my gosh, I can't even say it. Steve Irwin. Um, technically, that was Animal Planet. Uh, we watched Time Warp Trio, Tuttenstein. You know, just these shows that were technically made for kids. They weren't raunchy. Um, they weren't you know, but we're missing those, right? We, I have not seen a show like that come out in forever. And you could say, oh, well, Disney, Disney's crap. I don't want to hear it. Disney does not put out any good stuff anymore. The last good thing they put out was Frozen 2, in my opinion. Encanto was okay as well. I didn't mind that one so much, but after watching it like 20,000 times because of the girls I babysit and also hearing we don't talk about Bruno about 50 million times, I think I'm good. But the thing is, is that there's no shows for preteens at all. Like, there's just, there's nothing. We had Saddle Club. We had, you know, all these shows, and they have, like, nothing. 
the kids are being raised on euphoria and friends and the office. And don't get me wrong. The office is hilarious. I love the office, but for older people, right? Like older kids, mean girls, um, those movies are hilarious, but they're not made for preteens. Preteens soak information up like a sponge. So they want to be what their peers are and they want to look a certain way. They want to be a certain way. And they learn all of this through social media and they learn all of this through watching the shows. So uh, for these kids to not have any preteen shows and not go through any awkward phases with blue eyeshadow and crop tops over these really bad tank tops and like those uh, Bermuda shorts and stuff like I'm sorry. Yes, I watched I watched Little House on the Prairie too, 100%. Um, but these kids don't have any of that. And so they're going right into Pretty Little Liars, Euphoria, Vampire Diaries, 13 Reasons Why, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, like all of these shows that are not meant for children. Don't even get me started on Skibbity Toilet. I don't even want to start on that one because... Oh, I, I cannot. It's almost as bad as that frog. The ding, 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 ding. I can't. I cannot. Mm -mm. So all of these things are leading to children growing up way too fast. There's too much responsibilities on kids' shoulders. They're not having a childhood anymore. I was lucky enough. My parents were like, yeah, we're, our kids are going to have a childhood. We're not putting them in school. I was homeschooled, which was really great. I got to explore my actual interests. I wasn't uh, burned out as a teenager going to school because I was able to pursue horseback riding. Uh, I was in bowling, I was in theater, I was in orchestra, I had cello lessons, I was doing voice, I, I was in recitals. Like I was able to pursue everything I wanted without being burned out because the schooling that I was getting was enough for me to learn but most of my schooling came from real world experiences. Like, okay, we have $20 at the grocery store. What can we get for $20 without going over? And then it's like, okay, well, if we add these up and then plus tax, like what's the tip at a restaurant? All of these things taught me life skills that I needed, but, um, you know, I didn't have to sit down with a workbook for eight hours a day crammed into a tiny school with, without like bodily a a autonomy, right? Like you are told when you can go to the bathroom, when you can't, you're told when you can eat and when you can't, you're told when you can speak and when you can't, that's not how kids learn. So, um, I was very lucky to be able to just be a child and we didn't get social media until I think I was 14, 13 or 14 when I officially got social media. And even then I wasn't really on it all that often. I was still outside climbing trees and fishing and changing, uh, sh sorry, chasing frogs and chickens and, you know, training my dog and doing things. The only social media I really had was YouTube. And I recently found some old videos of mine and I just, I watched them with Max and he roasted me, obviously. You have, it's, it's impossible not to roast me if you see the videos. I'm not showing them because I found them on a DVD because they are so cringy. You guys would die. You guys would die of cringe. So we're not showing those. But I only had YouTube. And like, that's it. So it's just interesting um, how it all works out in the end. But these kids, these poor kids, they're crammed in schools. They're depressed. Eight-year-olds are diagnosed with depression. Let me just repeat that. Eight-year-olds have depression. Kind of weird, huh? Like, oh, interesting. Interesting. Um, would you recommend homeschooling a fifth grader? Is there autonomy with students being homeschooled or do parents need to be there helping teaching the whole day? Honestly, homeschooling is not a one-fits-all. What worked for me isn't going to work for another person. But sometimes homeschooling is like an hour or two of workbooks and the rest of it is literally going outside and learning about interesting things. Um, you, when I was a kid, we were in soccer, we were in music, we were in theater, we were in a, a homeschool groups. We were a part of Little Flowers and Blue Nights, which was a boy girl uh, group. And we learned how to braid, make 
puppets. We learned about God. We learned dancing. We learned a whole bunch of things. Um, we were also in dance for quite a while, ballet, uh, tap, da- tap dance, and jazz. And so, yeah, I just, yeah, I I feel like when it comes to kids, it's not a one-size-fits-all, um, but homeschooling and being able to set up and schedule those social times with the friends and everything is really important, but I definitely think that it's doable, you know, for a fifth grader. I don't, I think they would thrive personally. And if for some reason homeschooling specifically isn't working, I was put into online school. You know, I still got to see my friends, um, you know, the ones that I had, and I was still able to go out and do everything I wanted because it, you know, but it's hard because kids need to learn discipline too. So you still need to be able to teach them a schedule. Um, but it doesn't have to be two hours every day. It's like, sometimes math is going to take an hour. Sometimes it's going to take 20 minutes. Uh, and you know, a couple subjects a day is enough. It doesn't have to be like eight subjects one day, every day. Mondays could be for math and science. Tuesdays could be for English and handwriting. Uh, you know, tying in the different things together, but also being able to not burn the kid out. You know, if they start struggling really hard and getting frustrated and stuff, time for a break, time for food, etc. Also, kids aren't ready to learn until like 10 a.m. So it's like not that they need to sleep in, but they can spend the morning time reading or playing and then they can start school at 10 or whatever works. So yeah, definitely. Um, do, 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 do. do you, uh, should kids not have access to a phone till like 13? Um, I wish I, yeah, I had a flip phone for a long time before I got a smartphone. Flip phones are fine, uh, personally for emergencies, but I just think that when it comes to phones, kids don't need them. It causes so many issues, not just mental, but also physical because they're bending over like this constantly, right? So what does that eventually do? It brings their head forward. It gives them chronic pain in their neck and their back. They start getting all of these issues before they're even in their 20s. That's why so many kids have back pain and all this stuff is because they're constantly just crunched over over their phone and it's bringing their head forward and your head weighs a lot, right? And it's basically being balanced on a toothpick, so to speak. And so there's a lot of physical issues um, that, you know, kids run into nowadays. Scoliosis too. Kids are giving themselves scoliosis because of phones and because of all these issues. So yeah, moms were kind of right. It is the phone. But I think, um, you know, it's just really important to uh, just not give the kid a phone. You're the parent. You you control, not the kid. Um, Do the parents need to be with the children being homeschooled or do they learn on their own? Children do need direction. Um, So there are gonna be some things where you are going to have to teach them stuff, especially when it goes by the curriculum. You're gonna have to teach them how to figure out math and stuff like that. You're going to have to walk them through the steps. But when it comes to figuring things out physically, how to take apart a chair, they can usually, you give them a screwdriver, you give them the tools to do it. And as long as it's not dangerous, you know, like don't give them a, don't give them a saw or anything like that. um, They'll be fine. They'll figure it out. Or, um, you know, give them a book and be like, oh, find these, these flowers in this area or something. Uh, kids are very, they, they're sponges, you know, the, um, they soak up everything. And so I think taking advantage of that's really important. Um, but all these kids nowadays are just growing up too quickly. When I was in sixth grade, I learned about, um, decimals and, uh, percentages, and we were learning how to divide and, uh, multiply. The, the, how do I explain this? Some of the kids that, I have watched in the past, and this was like a really long time ago, when they were in uh, third or fourth grade, they were learning how to do multiplication and division and decimals. It's like they're trying to move it up 
more and more. So the kids have to learn these things sooner and sooner. And then when a kid can't keep up or can't mentally be there because for whatever reason, everyone's built a little different, you know, you ask a monkey to climb a tree, the monkey can climb the tree, but you ask a goldfish to, and they're like, what? It's the same thing in the school system. Everything's the same. So for each kid, sometimes now they have some programs that can help kids who are special learners, but for the most part, they're all thrown into the same system and it's supposed to work for all of them who all have different learning styles, different ways, you know? So I think um, it's just interesting to see how it all works, but to know that a lot of kids are suffering and are diagnosed with these issues, when in reality, they just the school system is the one that just messed them up. For example, I have dyslexia, right? So I, I have that. And for some people, it could genuinely be genetic. For me, it's not. And that's because of the way I learned how to read. You're supposed to learn how to read through phonics, right? Sounding out the letters as you go about them from right, or sorry, from left to right. And you're sounding out those, those um, letters. I learned it, and this is how most of the kids in the school system are learning it, to just memorize the shape of the word and how it sounds. And when we do that, we look at a glance, we glance at a word, and because we never learned to read left to right, our eyesight just goes berserk, basically. We start reading right to left, we start mixing up the, the letters because our mind was not taught to sound out the words from left to right. And so what we do, we look at a word, we memorize what it is, but we don't understand the deeper meaning. So we just kind of go throughout it. And instead of just understanding what it actually means, uh, uh, our brain just kind of malfunctions. And that's why I have dyslexia. Now, there are some people that genuinely have the whole dyslexia thing, but I do not. I memorized what the words looked like. And now I'm retraining myself to do phonics and it's healing my dyslexia. I barely have dyslexia anymore because of that. It's insane to me how crazy this all is. So anywho, cursive also should be required. Hot take. I, people have too many ugly handwriting these days. I know some people are like, oh, I print really pretty. And I'm like, print is not a signature. You need to be able to write and read cursive. I was lucky enough, I can't do cursive, but I can read it. Uh, and my fiance has wonderful cursive. So I'm just saying, um, that is that is my hot take for the day. Cursive should be required at all schools. So anywho, I have to hop off now because I need to go run some errands, but thank you so much guys for hopping on here and talking with me. I know we kind of went on a bunch of different little topics here, but I love being able to just discuss these things because I feel like we all have such good information and I'm just, you know, always so excited to hear about your guys' thoughts and your experiences. Thank you to everybody who has donated and who has sent us donations. Really, really do appreciate that. It really helps us keep the ministry going. If you want one of the haters will be prayed for hats, you can get them on my website at thereligioushippie.com underneath the donation center, uh, donation center tab. And uh, yeah, I just hope you guys have a blessed rest of your day. Know that I'm always praying for you. Please, uh, please pray for my family, my dad. He started radiation um, this morning. So yeah, and uh, I will see you guys later. So um, yeah.